welcome everyone uh, to another one of our um, really interesting and great lunch breaks, if we may say so ourselves. Um, I'm super excited today uh, to welcome Jack Myers, uh, the world's leading media ecologist and founder of Media Village and AdvancingDiversity.org. Uh, good friend of mine, really, really smart guy. Uh, for more than 40 years, Jack has influenced the decisions of hundreds of media marketing, advertising, and entertainment companies and organizations. So he's a true expert. Um, Jack's Media Village is the media world's leading resource for marketing intelligence, business connections, and talent development. And I know that you're working with quite a few of our members already today. So, so you're, you're already in out of home. Um, and today for us and, and for you, our audience, uh, Jack will break brand new Myers Report research, and he will also share his best pitch ideas for Out of Home today, uh, all intended to drive revenue growth for you all, and especially now as we're coming out of this tough year that we've been in. Um, Jack, do you want to tell the people on, on the webinar who may not know you as well a little bit about more about Media Village and who you are? Uh, sure, if we can uh, bring bring the slide up. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you, Anna, so much for uh, inviting me to join you today. And I know there are uh, several uh, friends and, and colleagues in the uh, in the audience. And I'm proud that uh, as a membership organization, uh, Media Village hosts uh, Outfront, Clear Channel, and Intersection among our members. Uh, we are, as as Anna said, uh, the, the, the industry's uh, home across the ecosystem of media, marketing, advertising, and entertainment, uh, the home for education, knowledge, and talent development. And in fact, we are launching uh, later this year a $1 million out-of-home advertising campaign in support of our uh, new content recommendation engine, meetingprep.com. So we appreciate the partnership of the out-of-home industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Jack. Um, so we've known each other, I think, I don't know if it's 10 years now, but a long Let's time. Let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> longer than we want to admit. Uh, but I actually want to go a little further back in time because, you know, as we were talking, uh, prepping for this, uh, for this conversation today, you told me a story that I actually never had heard. And we've never really talked about out of home uh, as much before either. So uh, before we get going on the content here, um, you do have a really fascinating story to tell. And I didn't know that you got started, your whole career basically started in out of home. Um, and you said to me that those early lessons in selling bus sites in Brooklyn, Queens and Staten Islands were you know, incredibly formative. And that's really where you learned how to sell and the kind of out of home uh, was the thing that kicked your career off there. So I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about that. And also of course, show us, show us some proof in, in the form of slime. Yeah. So some of you may remember what we called the busorama back in the 1970s. They were backlit signs on top of the bus. And uh, as, when I joined, it was my first job out of college um, in the early 1970s, uh, selling bus advertising. And, and I remember, uh, couldn't find a job in New York. I went to, saw an ad for an account executive for a radio TV firm, and I, I loved radio TV, so I, uh, went on the interview and he said, well, this is a sales job. And I thought, I, I've never sold anything. But I said, sounds great. Love sales. And uh, he said, well, this is selling bus advertising. And I said, thought to my, my brain said, I don't know anything about bus advertising, but the words that came out of my mouth were big type. You know, I, bus ads have to be really large type. They have to call out in there that they reach more people than any other medium. He said, you got the job. And uh, I spent uh, three and a half years. I started uh, same, almost the same day with a guy named Billy Applebaum, who many of you remember, went on to uh, become very wealthy uh, in, in uh, bus, subway, uh, out-of-home advertising. I, I left uh, to get into radio and then television, but a couple, three claims to fame. One, I was the first one to sell what we called the total, total bus at the time. Uh, which was every ad inside and out. And then I was also the first one to sell the full interior uh, to both Bowery Bank and the New Yorker magazine. And, and they were really breakthrough campaigns. And what I learned, I, I had no data. I had nothing other than ideas. And that's where I really 
learned that bring to bring an idea with you, whether you were whether I was going out to sell uh, the local priest in the Bronx to buy bus ads to, to promote his the feast or the Chinese restaurant in Queens or the New Yorker, Gordon's Gin and, and Bowery. It was always the idea that sold. And uh, I'll, I'll bring up a second, my other claim to fame around uh, transit advertising, go to the next slide. Uh, that's me in the middle. Uh, this was a bus ad at, uh, uh, for Saki. Uh, the difference is delightful. And the, I sold the idea of buses uh, to promote promote it to a small agency that didn't have a big budget and asked me to be the model. Uh, that jacket was actually a suit. So imagine uh, that jacket as pants also. It, it was not a pretty sight to see me walking down the street. But uh, that ad was on the tail light, the back of buses for six months uh, in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island. And it was actually the first time sake was imported into the country. Well, I mean, I, I love this ad and I told you that before. I, I, I'd never seen it before, but I think I think it's just fantastic and you look so good in it. I'm not a fan of sake um, at all, but I, I might even try it after having viewed this. Well, the <laughs> irony is I'm not a fan of sake either. You'll notice the one of the women has a beer in her hands too. So that that was kind of yeah, that's funny. So. <laughs> so sort of a double whammy for liquor there. Uh, well, I mean, but I, I love your point. And I think, I mean, I think sometimes we get too wrapped up in all the data and the smartness and the AI and, you know, just it, it's becoming so mechanical, right? Advertising. Uh, I, I still think it comes back to the core, you know, uh, back in the day, you know, all you had were your ideas. I think that's still, and especially for out of home, ideas and creativity is, is what's kind of carrying our whole medium so we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that as we're talking a lot maybe, about maybe you know, we can take that that off the screen because i can't look at myself anymore <laughs> but <laughs> i could but uh, but yeah we'll, we'll have more to show um well thank you that's that's amazing um, thanks for sharing that uh, well, thanks for thanks for sharing it with us. Um, but you know, I want to get I want to get get going on the content now. So let's get to to the breaking news. Um, your annual Myers report is beyond a must read. I follow it, you know, um, if not daily, but whenever it comes out, uh, and you all should too. Um, Jack, what's the latest? You know, this is the I've been doing research for thirty five years now among advertiser and agency executives. We've added consumers, and. Uh, we, we do two major studies, one on a media brand, 150 media content brands and perceptions, looking at the perceptions of consumers, advertisers and agencies. And then we also do an annual survey on perceptions of advertisers and agencies towards 60 media sales organizations, including several uh, out of home companies. Uh, and this is the first year where we're seeing two major trends. One is, absolute inconsistency among the different stakeholder groups. Uh, very few companies other than Amazon, Netflix, and one or two others of the OTT streaming TV video companies uh, are perceived equally by advertisers, agencies. And then when you take the media brands and you focus in the consumers, you have, again, radical differences in perception. So what we've lost over the last several years as we focused more on data and as we focused more on multi-platform, we've lost the value of the brand. Uh, the brand of the, among, not, on, um, not only among consumers, but more importantly, the brand equity of a sales organization uh, and its content among advertisers and agencies. And we've also found that across different age groups, across different uh, gender identities, across different cohort groups, uh, again, we're seeing radical differences. So if you can bring up the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about the reasons behind this, uh, this challenge, but also this opportunity. Uh, I, w there's no debate but that we're in a transformational time. But the difference of where we are now versus where we were just a year ago or five years ago is that COVID-19 has accelerated changes that have been happening for a couple of decades. And we're now into the first stages of what will be the next 10 to 20 to 30 years. We're just coming out of what has been 
the digital and internet and mobile and gaming transformation uh, of the past 30 years. So this is the mo kind of a moment in time and it's a huge opportunity if you understand the changes that have taken place in the marketplace that you're selling to. Keeping in, in context that you're competing uh, with 800 national sales organizations. The OAAA is competing with 100 trade associations for attention. Now, the challenge there is that the consumers, the stakeholders who you're talking to are not paying attention. So they're in their own world, which is increasingly disintermediated from your organization, from your message, and from your brand. There are the average age of the new media buyer planner, and we've been seeing this for about the last five years, it's getting younger and younger. So that 60% plus of those who are making the buying planning decisions have been in the business fewer than eight years and are very heavily focused on data and heads into the computer. It's kind of going back to what we used to refer to when I was selling bus advertising as the green eye shade uh, people looking down at the, at the calculators. Uh, the percentage of diversity at the agencies and at the brands in just the past year uh, as a direct result of Black Lives Matter has transformed significantly where the percent of the, that 62% uh, is now uh, well over 20% and heading higher of diverse. Uh, the percentage of Black uh, people in the industry has gone in just the last year from less than 5% to almost 15%. So the new people being hired into the community at the agency and at the in-house agencies and, and the day-to-day -day decision making around media are increasingly diverse and increasingly young and increasingly disconnected from traditional relationships. Uh, the pe those people in the television and industry who have been, you know, the core dozen decision makers are almost all gone or in other positions not related to the day-to-day -day buying and planning anymore. At the client level, two thirds of CMOs and 70% of the brand and procurement budget holders, budget owners, uh, have no marketing experience. They're, they're in a pass-through job where marketing is one of their responsibilities, but no longer their priorities. And that's being moved more and more to the agencies and the in-house agencies. They actually spend less than 2% of their time on media. 30 years ago at P&G or Unilever, the packaged goods companies and elsewhere, uh, the, today's brand manager, or product manager was called a, an advertising manager. They spent 60% of their time on advertising. Today, they spend 10 or 12% of their time on advertising and only 20% of that on media. So they're not, and, and when they do have meetings related to media, it's typically their in-house people or their agencies, and it's low on the totem pole in terms of the priorities. And then they're only dealing with the big ideas, the big opportunities, the sponsorships or data and analytics. And they are meeting, however, personally with Amazon, with Facebook, with Google, and increasingly with Walmart media, with Roundell Media Reimagined by Target, Kohl's, Kroger, CVS, Walgreens, all of whom are now media, competing for media dollars, which are flowing up from the below the line promotional budgets. So the challenge is that commerce is rising to the top in terms of a priority. Data and analytics is changing because it's becoming much more first party commerce related data. Uh, the type of data that even an NBCU with their NBCU one platform and really investing in you know, multi-company data platforms are being relegated lower and lower in terms of the decision-making. It's more important to the agencies to have data that they can factor into their own data libraries, having purchased some of the largest data and analytics companies in the world that now sit within the agency holding companies. So the bottom line is, and we can uh, go back to, you know, stop sharing for a second. Thanks. The, the reality is that for the first time, I believe we have a level playing field that everyone is now on the field and everyone has an equal chance, whether it's Viacom, NBCU, 
uh, to battle for dollars. And the challenge is that the agencies as the disintermediaries, and then you also have in the digital and programmatic and automated space companies like Trade, Trade Desk and Mag, Magnite, uh, Xander and, and others that are really taking and, and becoming data disintermediators between the media brand, the media seller and uh, the agency. Uh, so it's a radically different landscape today than it's ever been. Well, I mean, wow, that this is really, really interesting. Uh, and I think in particular, and you're spot on, right? Um, and I heard somewhere, um, I think Bill Gates said that in the last year, we've gone through basically seven years of development just because there's been so many changes, everything's kind of been thrown up in the air. And then technology has sped up, you know, um, the, the evolution too. And I think in particular, maybe around commerce. Um, and this could be really good for the out of home industry because, you know, we've always been a, a kind of steady going vertical chugging along, along on our 4% in the US more in some other markets and, and countries. Um, but not really ever completely part of the overall media mix, a, a separate buy, so to speak. But if you're saying that it's all level playing field now, uh, that means that we have an opportunity to enter in and, and, and grab more share. Um, so what's your advice for us? How can we sell ourselves more effectively? And what do you think are our key differentiators as we're now comparing ourselves to different media platforms, probably even more, and also selling to different entities? Well, um, uh, you can put the next slide up, but, uh, but I will say as a direct answer, uh, sell your strengths. And I think there are two areas where your strengths are indisputable. One is reach, overall reach. As I knew back when I was selling bus advertising, you know, the way I got my job at uh, what was WPLJ, ABC Radio coming out of out of home, uh, I, I looked around the landscape and saw that radio was not using any out of home advertising. And we were the only medium bigger than they were. So I went to all the radio stations and within six months, they were all on buses. Uh, it's, it's an important sell. And the other opportunity that's not really here, but is creativity and the idea. Uh, the creative agencies have got to get in the game of updating their creative for television, radio, podcasting. They are still operating in the 1970s with the creative models, the 30 second commercial, 15 second commercial, the banner. It's outdated, it's old fashioned, it looks old, you, you don't want it. And in an OTT ad free home or limit or fast forward home, you need to be developing new strategies out of home is a perfect place for the creative agencies to easily start looking at more creative approaches. And as Outfront has been sharing at their platform at Media Village, the creativity is alive in the out of home industry like no other medium. And selling that and highlighting that as Outfront has done has just been a game changer, uh, I think, for many, uh, for many agencies. So that's a number one opportunity. As you look at the, the, the drivers of growth, uh, there are basically out of home and other media need to get out of the competing with yourselves model. We're in a share game in the industry. It's advertising as a, as a business has been pretty much zero growth when you remove Facebook, Google, Amazon, and a couple of others. Fighting with each other for share is not the winning game. Where are the budgets coming? How do you get those budgets? And the cost of entry, the ante onto the field, into the game is data and analytics, advanced tech solutions, and multi-platform. I'm not going to go into detail on any of those. They stand for themselves. And that's what the agencies and the clients who are, are paying attention are looking for and looking at in a lot of their decision making. Bring up the next slide. The differentiators today are trusted relationships. As I said, the relationships have been collapsing. The, these young new people are in heads in the computer. Their relationships, frankly, are with the trade desk and Magnite and their data partners. Uh, and it's important and opportune. 
but you're developing relationships in a different way. It's not necessarily one-to-one. -one. It's how you communicate. It's how you promote. It's how you market yourself. Cost efficiency, of course, is always a differentiator. Brand safe environment, the number one asset that Out of Home has is brand safety. It's a message that's strong, powerful, and important. Targeted reach, of course, the many different ways you can use Out of Home, the different, commun the different custom targeted audiences, uh, video is available in different communities. So you are a multi-platform industry and you do offer many opportunities for targeted reach. And then of course, relevant content association has been relegated down in terms of prioritization for the industry, but relevant content association is always an idea-based opportunity uh, to show where there is content association available. And content is not only traditional content, content is being outside of a Walmart, content is being on the path toward a, a target. Uh, that's content association. There are, there are many different ways to skin that cat. And if you go to the next slide, so getting into the game, uh, opportunities, branded content, programmatic, innovation, these are things that you can bring in. They're not, they're not required. They're not even all that important in many instances but they are ways to get into the game and to get attention being paid to you by those who are not necessarily highlighting out of home as a, uh, as a place for their, for their advertising. And then the next slide, here are the game changers. Here, here are the, the win-win opportunities that are unique. And we've spent 10 years at Media Village and advancingdiversity.org, a $20 million research effort over the last decade to identify the drivers of growth for media and advertising. And what we've identified fundamentally, uh, not only looking where there's been success within our own industry, but more importantly, where other industries uh, have, have differentiated themselves and moved from flat to negative growth to significant increases in their overall industry-wide budgets. Cultural evolution, focusing on team diversity, recognizing where the clients and, at, and agencies are in terms of their young and diverse teams, demonstrating that your purpose and mission led both as an industry as well as in individual companies, being able to present yourself as being future focused, idea based, developing new approaches to traditional media, as well as new technology opportunities for how to communicate. And I like to say be the smartest one in the Zoom. When you have that opportunity, be the smartest one they're talking to have the knowledge, have the intelligence, do your homework. And that's why we've launched meetingprep.com with a million dollar out of home campaign. Meetingprep.com will be the number one source of knowledge, insight, and intelligence, not only for the buyer, planner, and client communities, but also for those diverse job seekers who may not think of our industry as a place uh, to work. So uh, really be smart. Uh, be intelligent. It's replaced relationship as the most important asset you bring to the table. And that means rethinking your B2B marketing, your communications, your PR, your publicity in the context of education. Who are your stakeholders and what are they learning from the messages you're putting into the market? So it means making your marketing and communications, publicity, PR smart as well. And that means looking at it through the prism of who is this educating and what are we teaching them and what are they learning from the messages we're putting out. So those are the game changers and those where I, where I think you're going to see more and more companies, more and more industries, more and more sales organizations focusing their efforts around education and diversity. And that's where we've made our bet at Media Village and AdvancingDiversity.org. And by the way, you're the first to uh, hear this, but uh, Advancing Diversity Week will be announced for uh, by and for the industry. Uh, May 10 through May 13 will be Advancing <coughs> Diversity Week. And then we'll also be hosting on May 13th, uh, the fourth annual Advancing Diversity Hall of Honors induction experience, uh, where we'll be inducting uh, Densu and 
uh, the, the AAF, the 4A's Foundation, American Family Insurance, uh, Citibank, and a number of others in the Advancing Diversity Hall of Honors. Well, I, wow. I mean, Jack, not only are you a great salesperson, <laughs> you really are, uh, even now, uh, but you also are, I mean, the, you're an expert in making things, I mean, there's so much information in here. There's so much that I want to unpack. This is really, really rich and, and very, very smart. Thank you. Um, I mean, yes, of course, I mean, diversity, top, top of mind for the out-of-home industry too. We fully recognize, you know, the whole kind of know your customer. We are, we, we need to up our game when it comes to diversity. We, we recently launched an initiative between uh, the OAAA Geopath and, and DSF, the Digital Signage Federation, to try and increase uh, diversity in our own in our own industry as part of advertising more broadly, because advertising isn't an industry that over indexes on this. But so that's, I think, number one. And, you know, relationships still matter. And, and you know, come prepared, know your customer, not just their end customer, but the customer too. I think that's a that's a really, really good point and something that, that everyone needs to work on. But I think in particular out of home as we're trying to sort of move up the value chain. Um, but it's interesting what you said also about uh, television and, and even OTT being difficult to, to advertise in. We've heard that from many thought leaders over you know, the past months as we've been doing these, these webinars and people keep coming back to that. Out of home is perceived, I think, by end users as a medium where they want to see advertising. They're, well, the ad is the content, right? So, so, um, so it's a medium where it's not a disruptive uh, experience as it is in, out of, in OTT where, you know, you, you really don't kind of want to see the ad. Uh, ad blocking and skipping is, is, is something that, um, that happens much more on those platforms. You can't do that in out of home. Um, well, that's, that's a really good point if I j jump in there. And, uh, you know, the word linear has become a very popular word because the, the reality of OTT is that it's replacing a lot of linear viewing, yeah. which is ad supported and uh, out of home is a linear medium. Yeah, but but it's it, but it's it's it, it, real it, time. It, it's real time and you can't you can't stop it and and it's also easier to buy therefore right than than ott where do you put your ad dollars how do you buy how do you know who's going to see it it's 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 a whole different experience and again can't block it can't skip it um so there's of course all of that um brand safety huge uh huge plus for us but then you know um just in general, all the other things that are happening around targeting and, and data and privacy and, and traditional media that I think we can use to our advantage. So um, we have a lot going for us, but we also have a lot of work to do. Um, what do you think out of what will out of home look like in, in the sort of the post pandemic area whenever or era whenever we reach that hopefully soon? And what do you think is out of home's place in the future of media and marketing? And they're thinking of te television as a medium, linear medium that used to have that widest reach. We may be the last one standing there. So what do you think our place is and how do we- So it's a great question. And, and it's, it is a, I mean, sir, you know, when I started, we called it outdoor. We didn't call it out of home. And then of course with uh, digital, you know, uh, indoor out of home media with screens and, and gyms and in th movie theaters and so on. That, of course, has been heavily impacted by uh, the pandemic. And, and I think many of the changes that we're going to see are going to be permanent. I think we'll, we'll have much more sensitivity around uh, being in, in crowds, being in, <clears throat> in play, you know, in, in large places, even small places with lots of people. So I think those realities are going to need to be confronted. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that uh, you have a, a strong new competitor that's always been there, but not really competing on the same, for the same budgets. And, and that is the retail industry uh, where they are the Walmarts, as the, all the retailers who I rattled off plus another 100, 200, 300 are looking at their own in-store media and are building them as media companies with separate sales organizations and budget goals. And it's not just you know, the announcements, but we're going to see more and more screens coming into the stores and they're going to be controlling that inventory and they're going to be in the market looking for those dollars. I do think that's going to impact uh, on Facebook and, and uh, other companies, other media. So I don't even consider Facebook to be a media company, frankly. I, I consider it to be, you know, something 
they're selling something and 98% of their revenues are from the local, local community. Um, but that having been said, I, I do think that the industry <clears throat> does need to find that path to come together and find your brand as, a, as an industry, as a community. And it's not a brand that's necessarily competing against each other. It's certainly not, you know, it's not out front versus Clear Channel versus Intersect Section versus Lamar and so on. Um, it, it's one industry finding a voice in the same way that the radio industry has expanded now to audio and audio is being sold as a medium that is rising, all ships are rising in the radio, traditional radio space because of podcasting. So well, I'm not sure that I can tell that I'm the one to tell you what the future looks like other than it looks like an industry coming together and defining its brand, its brand message, as a community and going to market together. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, and we're actually, we're going through that exercise right now. Uh, but, you know, one could argue that um, just like with radio is interesting, right? Because that's expanded into streaming, to podcasting, spoken word, and now also voice technology. Uh, one could argue that Out of Home is going through the same thing. You mentioned outdoor advertising before. You know, we rebranded our industry, I think five or six years ago to the out of home industry for that specific reason. As you mentioned, it's not just about outdoor, it's about indoor out of home as well. One could argue that retail is part of that, right? Like it's all about basically signage uh, and screens in different locations, I think with smart cities and 5G technology and the ability to sort of tie uh, a number of endpoints together, you know, the screen outside of the supermarket and the screen inside of the supermarket can be connected. So, and, and you know, offline to online with QR codes and other things can, can bring the shopping experience it can start way outside of the store, right? So I think for us, it, you're, you're, I think what is the future? And now I'm answering my own question, but I think it's for us to create it and decide what we wanna be a part of. I mean, if you're thinking about programmatic in-store in store, um, and retail uh, signage should will probably be transected in the same way because it's one to many, it has all those same things. So we need to kind of connect mm -hmm. probably more to that, uh, or at least we should see the opportunity there. And if you think of what's happened in Japan, where, you know, kiosks, massive kiosks, there's, you can shop in, in the subway, you have, the, you know, you, you point to your point, the QR codes or, you know, the mobile device, and, and many of, of your members are using, you know, mobile devices proactively as part of the creative advances uh, for the industry and making that direct consumer connection. Uh, how you how you scale that, uh, how how that digital connect, connectivity becomes part of the ecosystem of of out of home, and you know I I I believe just like you know the word radio has transformed to audio, you know is out of home is you know the right term uh, yeah. even today yeah. is it. <laughs> Is it, you know, it's, it's, you are a truly visual, immersive uh, media opportunity. And, and I think that with smart cars being able to read billboards in the future or out of home placements in the future, that they're from a technology point of view, we may be 10 years away, uh, but smart sales organizations like being the smartest person in the Zoom uh, relates to here's where we're headed. Here's what you want to be a part of today. Here's what you want, where you want to be learning, how you want to be learning, exploring, testing, introducing new creative themes, because it's really hard to introduce new creative themes with television and even radio. The direct-to-consumer products that have moved directly into uh, television from digital, bypassing uh, other media, uh, finding those opportunities uh, to be promoting around the retail stores where who they're competing with. Yeah, I mean, and that that's that's actually well, a direct consumer brands love out of home, and I think it you know have used it very successfully. So I think we should probably rip a page out of that playbook and and start applying that to other thing because there you really truly have the offline to online. Um, you um, have you're moving commerce into our domain, and you're you're being 
very different in your thinking around advertising. And again, I don't, we don't have lack of ideas in our industry. I think it's, it's just starting to think of ourselves in a broader perspective is good. And actually I see uh, Ian Dallimore, one of our, uh, one of our <laughs> members pointed out here that, you know, we have to stop competing against ourselves and come together. And it's true. We as an industry are so focused on ourselves. I heard that when I took this job, oh my God, we need to stop talking to ourselves. And it's true. Uh, you know, for someone who's out there everywhere, we should, we should position ourselves probably more as a bigger, broader platform and start competing with other forms of media, or at least talk about how we're complementary because we certainly are to, to a lot of other types. Um, and then yeah. I, I, do, I do believe, and again, hi Ian, by the way, uh, I do believe that uh, brand safety is a critical message. Overall reach uh, advantages that you have over all other media is an advantage. And creativity, I think is a huge advantage because none of the other uh, sales organizations or media are going to the creative agencies. They're all going to the media agencies. They're all getting very deep into the data discussions, which are to a certain extent a dead end. Um, and, and I think there, I know some of you may not want to hear that, but uh, but there's a, I think there's a huge opportunity to open up and find those new agencies that are not necessarily the media agencies, but are part of the holding companies, the creative agencies, the sales promotion agencies. Uh, the PR agencies, uh, it's a great opportunity to, dif to step out and differentiate yourself, but with a message that's uniform across the whole industry and is built on their needs, not your traditional selling message. Very, very true. But I want, I want to ask you because I, I yeah, so the agency model is changing, right? And I feel like we're, we're kind of maybe maybe it will start leading with creative and not with data in certain aspects, or maybe it will be different types of agencies that will be um, that will be in front of the advertisers. Coming back to your point also about the advertisers having changed so much. A lot of them aren't, you know, the, the, the CMO of today is not just the marketer, has so many different functions under themselves. So, so that, you know, I think that that's important to know too. How can you cater to all those different things? And and, um, you know, whether it's marketing automation or it's commerce or it's CRM or, or it's plain media and, and advertising. Um, but I want to come back to out of home. Um, and again, you know, us not competing with each other and um, or ourselves and also how we position our medium um, over or jointly with other forms of media. So and you, it can certainly be both. But I'd love to hear your reflection on out of home, should we sell it um, and sort of sell it in competition with television or radio or print or whatever it is? Or should we talk about it as a medium that should be in combination with other forms of media? Because again, you know, it, it leads to, you know, that you, it could be a cheap media buy, right? Because you can get so much social media, but it's very complementary potentially to other forms as well. So how do you think we should pitch it well, as a standalone or as a combination? Well, I'm sure that depends on who you're talking to and, and what they're, what their priorities are and, and how they're in fact looking at, uh, at, at their own budget. Are, are they looking at you as part of a total mix or are, are you talking to an advertiser who's looking to find one place to, where they'll dedicate their budget and, and that'll direct that. Uh, I do believe that uh, it's, it's a, uh, the television industry right now is at its peak point of disarray. Uh, and and you've lost most of the traditional relationship relationships on the buyer side, the the legacy owners of the, the the upfront budgets on both the buyer and the seller side have has been completely disrupted. Uh, you've got a completely different dynamic in terms of the decline of linear viewing, the uh, and and the growth of non-ad supported television. So advertisers are, and you've got advertisers right now, you've got this kind of buzz and, and you know, hype about moving into the ad supported <clears throat> OTT platforms, the Disney plus the HBO max, they're going to sort themselves out over the next two to three years. And, and I think they'll, they'll find that the opportunities there are not uh, replacing the lost television ratings in, in the same way that many people think they might. So advertisers are going to be looking for alternatives and they're going to be looking for reach alternatives. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, there is an opportunity 
it's not a negative against, it's just a reality of where the market's headed and yeah. being able to see that, anticipate that and move toward that uh, by developing the counter position of here are the alternatives, here are the other options. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with podcasting. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts. It's very hot right now. But, you know, I think advertisers are sorting out now for the first time what works and what doesn't work. And then you have this huge data move uh, with, with the agencies and this focus on uh, taking first party advertiser data, but the agencies want their own data. They, they, are, they are marketing their own data and they want data that fits into their data pool and is not an alternative to their data pool. So I think from a data, it's, it's, it's important to look at each of the main holding companies to understand how they're building out their data and then to build data capabilities that fit in to yeah. their automated systems and their data systems. And once you're there and embedded, that's gonna put you on a level playing field with all other media. And it'll be content and media neutral. And that's where I see us headed five to 10 years from now, decisions will be media neutral. And as long as you're there, as long as you're present, I think your advantages as an industry are going to be at the top of the hierarchy. Yeah, and, well, and that's an exciting opportunity. I like that media neutral. That's a, I'm going to steal that term. Uh, it's a really, really good one. I think, though, I mean, it's one thing to be um, to be included in the agent. We're certainly taking strides as an industry to make sure that our programmatic solutions are not just for out of home, but that it ties into overall uh, DSPs, etc. But I think, and I, I see this coming quite recently from the media side into out of home. I mean, the big conversation there is not just about the agencies, about advertisers being to, able to use their data and, and doing a direct connection with the in-house agency or the advertiser so they can create their own bespoke solution. And I think that's going to become incredibly important in particular for our platform as it's so close to the consumer and you're not in a, surrounded by other forms of media. You're not in a stream, right? Uh, in, a, in a Facebook feed or on a, in a television show, you are the sign. So, so I think there, we have work to do when it comes to data overall. Um, I want to ask you one quick question here that, that sort of comes back to how we position ourselves. You've kind of answered it, but I would love to hear a little bit more on it. Uh, Rick Robinson from Billups uh, has asked thoughts on pointing out brand safety and out of home without coming off too critical of the dominant investment mode agencies and brands have in digital and programmatic. It's yeah, first of all, I, I don't think you can, uh, you don't need to be too critical because the industry is doing a, the other media are doing a pretty good job of creating non brand safe environments uh, without your having to point it out. I think it's, it's more selling your strength. Uh, it's one of the, the core strengths and pointing out that core strength, uh, let the buyer, let the advertiser draw their own assumptions about what's brand, what's not brand safe because it's different for every, uh, for every buyer, uh, for every client and, and just sell your strengths and sell your positive uh, brand safety as, as one of your, I, I think it should, you know, again, uh, be one of the primary mentions. And I don't think you need to be negative at all. I think the world is being negative. And it's similar with data privacy on, on a lot of the data issues, which are coming home to roost. And on the digital side, the, the shifts that Google is making, the collapse of cookies. Uh, there's, I'll say what I said, I've said at the beginning and, and in the middle, middle, I'll say it again at the end. There's never been more uh, disruption at the point of evolution, evolutionary change and revolutionary change. There's never been a better time to define yourself, to be very clear and to position yourself for the future and to be smart about how, what you envision that future to be and how you fit into it appropriately. And you'll find your market, your place in the market. And, and I do think that brand safety is one of those core attributes that uh, will rise to the top in terms of an important, increasingly important one. Yeah, another one on that kind of in that vein that we don't talk enough about either, I feel, is around fraud and, and waste. Uh, again, coming back to the CMO and the CFO, uh, looking at marketing differently these days. I mean, you 
investment, if you're investing in digital, especially through programmatic channels, you'll have 30, 40% waste of your dollars. You know, they're not, it's impressions that are fraudulent, won't be seen, double layered below the, the, the fold, whatever. Uh, whereas in our medium, you know that the ad will yeah. pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time render, it's there, it's physical. Yet we are the only medium who actually take photos and prove <laughs> <laughs> hey, I used to I used to go at eleven o'clock at night when all when all the buses were back in the garage. I used to go with the client, and you know I'd take a club to protect myself. But we'd count the bus posters. That was our. Uh, but I I am a little wary of of using that back to Rick's kind of core point of uh, being negative. Uh, that the CFOs do not seem to care that much about that issue of of uh, of media of fraud and the 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 it's not just the fraud it's it's that the middle the intermediaries the middlemen and data are taking 50 60 cents out of every dollar between what the advertiser spends and and what the media gets and that's that's been you know a, a problem with digital for for many many years and it doesn't seem to be resonating as an issue uh as it should be. Well, I, I, I think, I think, hopefully, it will one day. But I think still the ecosystem sort of there are all these different players that are feeding off of it. But we, we have a chance as we're building our own digital stack to avoid some of that. I hope. Um, all right, Jack. We uh, and all the the panelists on. It's been this has been a really great webinar. We've had a, sort of a whole sad conversation of people chiming in, which is great. I don't know that everybody could see it, but thanks for everyone who contributed. Jack and I certainly saw it. Um, I want to ask you one final, final question because I, I think it's really cool that you're doing it. And then, and then sadly we are at, we are at, uh, at the hour, uh, but, um, you talked a little bit about it in the beginning, uh, but I want to hear, since you're doing an actual out of home campaign, can you tell me a little bit more about your media village, $1 million out of home campaign? Yeah, we're, we're focusing in again on two, uh, core constituencies. We're focusing in number one on the, uh, the underserved communities, the HBCUs, uh the communities that uh we need to have interest in advertising and media as a as a career uh college level high school level we're partnering with the aaf to develop programs and initiatives and we'll be reaching out <clears throat> again to uh bring them into our community through a number of initiatives the primary one is the search and content recommendation engine to help them prepare uh, for their internships, for their first jobs, uh, for meetings once you're there in the industry, to help them advance up through their career through a search and content recommendation engine at meetingprep.com. <clears throat> that is, be the smartest person in the Zoom, <clears throat> go to meetingprep.com. The, uh, the other uh, target audience are the agencies, and most importantly, those brand and procurement people who are spending 2% of their time in media. What we learned, and this was research we did with, with P&G, with, with uh, Unilever, with AB, and many others, uh, where we learned that the biggest issues for the agencies and even the in-house agencies was getting time with the people who owned the budgets, and that the biggest problem was that those people came to meetings unprepared. So we researched among those brand and procurement people and found that their number one source of knowledge about media and advertising was LinkedIn learning uh, and Bing and Google, and, and they rated it three to four on a scale of 10 in terms of usefulness. And that led to two years in investing well into the six figures in an AI-based uh, search and content recommendation engine at meetingprep.com. It just came out of beta and launched this week. If you visit meetingprep.com and search out of home, search outdoors, search out front or intersection or clear channel, it highlights and optimizes the 15,000 pieces of original educational content we have at Media Village Knowledge Exchange. But then we also have 30 other content partners who feed into the, uh, into the content database. So we're using uh, focused on an out of home campaign to reach the brand, the leading 200 national advertisers, uh, the leading 40, 50 HBCUs and uh, diversity focused uh, colleges and universities.
Well, I, we, I love that you're doing that, especially since we, since we are also very deeply rooted in, in, in. And I'm really proud to be partnering with, with Outfront, Clear Channel, and Intersection so far in that campaign. So thank you and a shout out to those companies. Well, I'm sure they appreciate it. We sure do too. Uh, and what better way to do it than in an out of home campaign. Um, Jack, this was fantastic. I was going to summarize and say, what are the key takeaways? But but I feel like there was a lot here. Um, so I just want to thank you for your incredibly inspiring words. So much smartness here. I'm going to rewatch this you. and, and re <laughs> re-listen to what you said. Uh, we will share Jack's contact, contact info so you can reach out and, and get involved and, and also, you know, learn more about these things. I think he has a lot of of great assets and resources that can be of help for all of us. And, and then again, so many smart ideas. Um, so thank you to everyone on the call today and huge thank you to you, Jack, for, for joining me. Uh, it was a true pleasure. Uh, I hope I see you soon again. I hope to see all of you soon again, maybe even in person. Thank I'm sure you. I'm sure we'll see you soon. And uh, thank you everyone. Thanks for being here today. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm honored and, and so happy after a long career to be back in the out of home business. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, everyone.